Okay, welcome back from Thanksgiving break. We're going to go and look at section 4.1, ATP and chemical energy. So energy is the ability to do work. That might be a definition you may or may not want to write down. Before we get further, a couple of things to keep in mind. A lot of you guys I'm seeing in your notes are just writing down what you see on the screen. Now in order to prepare you for college, you need to write down and listen to what I'm actually saying. I put the slides up so I can look at them um, and kind of have a, a, an outline to follow, but you need to take notes on what I'm saying. So the benefit is you can stop and rewind and listen to the definition of energy again if you need it. You can pause it. You can watch this numerous times. Um, but if you are just writing down exactly what you see on the screen, you're going to start getting docked points because when you guys go to college, that's not going to help you at all. The teacher's going to say a lot more. The professor, as they get known as, will say a lot more uh, from their mouth than what's actually showing up on a screen. So I want you guys to get in the habit of doing it now. And again, continue to write questions down in your notes um, because I will be collecting your notes at some point during the winter term for a grade. Um, and they'll probably be about a um, equivalent to a test grade. So make sure you're taking good notes. If you feel like you want 100 on the notes, then prove to me that you want 100. Okay, so back to chemical energy and ATP. Again, energy is the ability to do work. Sometimes the need for energy is easy to see. For example, a lot of you guys are athletes. It obviously takes a lot of energy to play hockey, basketball, wrestling, soccer. However, there are times that the need is less obvious. For example, when you are sleeping, your cells are quietly busy using energy to build new molecules, contract muscles, and carry out what's known as active transport, uh, which all you need to know about active transport is that it uses energy. Simply put, without the ability to obtain and use energy, life as we know it would not exist. So energy comes in many forms, including light, heat, electricity. Can, energy can also be stored in chemical compounds as well. For example, um, hopefully none of you who are boarders light candles, but when you do light a candle, um, the wax melts, soaks into the wick, and is burned. As the candle burns, chemical bonds between carbon and hydrogen atoms in the wax are broken. New bonds are formed between these atoms and oxygen, producing carbon dioxide and uh, water. These new bonds now are at a lower energy state than the original chemical bonds in the wax. The energy lost is released as heat and light in the glow of the candle's flame. So one of the most important compounds that cells use to store and release energy is known as adenosine triphosphate, abbreviated ATP. ATP consists of adenine, a 5-carbon sugar called ribose, and 3 phosphate groups. As you're going to see as we move on in these slides, the, those phosphate groups are the key to ATP's ability to store and release energy. So speaking of storing and releasing energy, cells can release the energy stored in ATP by controlling, uh, by controlled breaking of the chemical bonds between the second and third phosphate groups. Because a cell can add or subtract these phosphate groups, it has an efficient way of storing and releasing energy as needed. ATP can easily release and store energy by breaking and reforming the bonds between the phosphate groups. This characteristic of ATP is exceptionally useful for a basic energy source for all cells. So that's talking about this guy up here, ATP and when we release energy. We take out that third phosphate right there, we break this bond, and you release it and you have this energy. Now for storing energy, so we're going to talk about our little friend down here, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, so the D means di, which is cut off in your screen, but uh, the di means two, tri means three. 
So adenosine diphosphate is a compound that looks almost like ATP, except that it has two phosphate groups instead of three. You can see those down here. There's only two Ps. The difference is the key in, to the way in which living things store energy. When a cell has energy available, it can store small amounts by adding a phosphate group, here's the phosphate, to the ADP molecules producing ATP. Okay, so there are, remember we talked about the carbon-based molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids? Well, there are three common carbon-based molecules that our body can and often does use to um, break down to produce ATP. Carbohydrates are the most common, um, uh, but uh, most commonly broken down to create ATP but they're not really stored in large amounts but the example they talk about in your book is a glucose molecule yields or creates up to 36 little ATP energy molecules so this is just showing you the triphosphate versus the diphosphate uh, you also then have your lipids which comprise about 80 percent of energy in your body and the lipids yield the most um, the most ATP you know from one triglyceride which is a fatty acid, you can get almost 146 ATPs. That's a lot. Uh, we go into proteins, which are the least common and most likely aren't the ones you're going to be looking at to break down and make ATP because the amino acids are not typically used for energy. As you all know, amino acids are used to create proteins. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that the proteins have about the same energy as a carbohydrate, but we don't necessarily use them. We use the, pro, uh, the protein more for the amino acids. So here you just see the molecule and the energy you get per milligram. So there are a few types of organisms that do not need sunlight. This is going to kind of get us into, we're going to kind of segue into photosynthesis. But before we talk about photosynthesis, there's one other synthesis, so to speak, that is not mentioned. So about 30 years ago, biologists discovered thriving ecosystems around volcanic vents in total darkness on the deep ocean floor. And I'm talking the deep, like the dark, dark, nobody goes down there, very dark, dark, dark. So obviously there's no light for photosynthesis. So the question was, who or what were the primary producers in that type of an ecosystem? Research has revealed that these deep sea ecosystems depend on primary producers that harness chemical energy from inorganic, inorganic molecules such as hydrogen sulfide. These organisms carry out a process called chemosynthesis in which chemical energy is used to produce carbohydrates. Chemosynthetic organisms are not only found in the deepest, darkest ocean. There are several types of chemosynthetic producers that have been discovered in more parts of the biosphere than anyone ever expected. Some chemosynthetic bacteria live in harsh environments such as deep sea volcanic vents or hot springs. Others live in tidal marshes along the coast. So here's an example of the deep dark depths of the ocean. So the process of chemosynthesis is essentially very similar to that of photosynthesis, uh, but they are going to use chemical energy instead of light energy. So in the next couple chapter, uh, next couple sections, we're going to talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. The only thing you need to know about chemosynthesis is that it uses chemical energy instead of light energy. It's similar to photosynthesis, and keep an idea of where it's actually happening. Hope this was helpful, and I will see you guys in class.